This is Open to Hope Radio, featuring Dr. Gloria Horsley and her daughter, Dr. Heidi Horsley, coming to you on behalf of the Open to Hope Foundation, dedicated to those who are looking for hope after loss. Now, here's Dr. Gloria. Welcome to the Open to Hope show. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria Horsley, with my co-host, Dr. Heidi Horsley. Uh, Good morning from California, Heidi. Morning, Mom. We've got a great show today with Stan Goldberg, and it's great to have him on because he's published seven books and written numerous articles and delivered more than 100 lectures and workshops, and he's got a wonderful book out I love. It's called Leaning into Sharp Points, Practical Guide and Nurturing Support for Caregivers. Welcome to the show today, Stan. I'm excited because he's sitting here in the studio with me today, which is a change. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate the the invite. Yeah, it's really fun. And he's one of our authors, too. Well, Stan, how did you get in the field of uh, grief and loss and recovery and helping caregivers and all that? Well, when I was uh, 57, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer. And I was still teaching full-time at the university. And that's San Francisco State. San Francisco State. And um, I tried to make sense of what my life had been and what it might become. Uh, I had a fairly aggressive form of prostate cancer. And I did what most people do when they have something seriously wrong with them is I pretended it didn't exist. Mm. And I, I literally laid in bed for three months after the surgery and watched reruns of movies. And uh, someone, a good friend of ours was having a party and she said, you know, please come. I know that you don't want to be around people right now, but there's someone here you have to meet. I said, fine. I went there and it was a gentleman who was 82 whose partner was, had just been admitted into the hospice wing um, in in San Francisco. And, uh, the reason he asked me to come is because I was a speech pathologist and his his partner had a stroke. So he wanted to find out how he and the staff could communicate with him. And I was very reluctant to go because I had placed students at Laguna Honda and it just was just too depressing for me. Uh, but I went anyway and um, I saw the most amazing thing, which were people who were dressed in street clothes going from bed to bed in the ward, and there just was this, the only I can describe it as an angelic look on their faces. And I said, who are these people? And I was told, these are volunteers. And I said, so these are people that are coming here to be with people they know are dying, and they're going to establish a relationship with them? And they said, of course. And that hooked me. Um, I, knew, I didn't know what these people were feeling, but whatever the look was on their face, I knew I wanted to experience that. And that's how I got into hospice. This was just the beginning of it. And so I was trained, and the first assignment was at uh, the Zen uh, Project Guest House. And um, the first patient I had was someone I eventually stayed with for 22 hours straight because it was Thanksgiving. And Uh and I left there, and I knew that I was a different person than when I started. And that's when I just started writing stories about people that I cared for. There are some people who feel they're ready to die. And, and being with them at their time of death is very different than being with someone who isn't ready. Those who are caring for someone who is ill don't understand they're living in a very different world. It's almost as if the illness that one has and the expectations form a vessel that you pour your current life into. So that applies both for the person who is ill and the person caring for them. And often that just leads to these conflicts, such as a caregiver saying, you know, my life has been devoted to this person. It's time for me to get on with it. And the person who's dying who says, but I'm not ready to leave. What would you say to people who are relieved that they died and are in this conflict that she didn't want to die? And do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, Um, I think... I think a lot of people carrying around a tremendous amount of guilt because as they were caring for someone they loved, they had thoughts that people said are are wrong or, or, or aren't correct. Uh, I don't know any person that I've counseled who is a caregiver who hasn't had some thoughts they wouldn't share with anybody. And I think 
uh, as long as caregivers believe that these are unnatural things, then they're going to harbor guilt for their entire lives. Um, it is very natural for a caregiver to think, my God, I wish this loved one would die already. And, and sometimes the wish is related to the pain the person is, the, the loved one is feeling. Other times that someone has given their whole life to caring for someone and they're, they're ready to get on. So the first thing I think is just you know to acknowledge that these are very natural feelings. You know you cannot give up your life for a loved one and not have negative consequences to yourself. If I'm caregiving 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, I'm going to assume many of those characteristics. And you know if when that role is over, and it's usually a very quick change in role, I'm lost. You know, I don't know what I'm going to do anymore. You know, how am I going to spend my time? So I, I think issues of identity are really crucial in caregiving. What I found is that quite often when we look at losses, what we focus on is replacing the person or the ability or the activity that we can't do anymore. And what I've seen is many people spend a lifetime trying to find that, and they can't. Uh, what, what I've learned, I think what, what works for me and works with many of the people that, that I've counseled, is instead of looking to replace the person that was lost, you initially try to find mm, out like what was the emotion or emotions that person engendered in you. One of the things that I loved most in life was fly fishing in wilderness areas by myself. And after I developed the, the cancer and uh, a sleep uh, disorder, I couldn't do that anymore, and I thought a significant part of my life was over. What I found was that it wasn't that I missed fly fishing in a stream in Wyoming. What I missed was the serenity that it created in me, and that's what I started to look for. So for me, it ended up learning to, to play and craft Native American flutes and Japanese bamboo flutes. But I've had clients who done the same thing where they lost a wife and they were able to identify what uh -huh. emotions that wife created in them. And they became, you know, the one guy became a master cabinet maker. Uh -huh. And he, because it, he was looking for the generation of the emotion rather than a specific person. What about guilt? What do, you, what do you do with guilt? This was a true story. This happened to me many years ago. I was in my 40s, and I was having some difficulty interacting with my wife and my kids and everything. And I went up to a place called the Shasta Buddhist Abbey, which is on the base of Mount Shasta. And the abbot said, you know, if there's anybody here that wants counseling, we have uh, priests who can counsel. So I thought, yeah, of course, I'll do that. And so after about 30 minutes, I'm looking to him for advice, and he just sat there, and he, he said the words that have still stayed with me for f almost 25 years. And he said, Stan, we do the best we can given the circumstances of our lives. When I have patients and, and caregivers tell me how terrible they feel they didn't do otherwise, I try to have them think about, well, what was going on in your life? you know, when you chose that. I think one of the biggest problems that I see in interactions, whether it's between someone who's ill or not, or just friends, is that we all, we, we tend to evaluate people we know based on our expectations of how they should act. Right. And as long as I keep trying to impose my values on other people, nobody will <laughs> right. ever please me. As long as I'm running away from something, uh, it will stay there as long as I run. Mm -hmm. And if I want to get over it, I need to start examining it. I have a website, and it's Stan Goldberg Writer, W-R-I-T-E-R dot -E com. Well, thank you for being on the show today, Stan. It's been my pleasure. Thanks, Stan, and thank you for everything you're, welcome. you're doing. You've been listening to Open to Hope Radio, hosted by Drs. Gloria and Heidi Horsley. Like today's edition, all of our past programs are available on demand at opentohope.com. 
along with helpful articles, videos, resources, and links to help get you through the toughest time of your life. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter and sign up for our monthly newsletter. Again, that's opentohope.com. Check it out today. Remember, others have been where you are. They made it through, and you can too, as long as you're open to hope.